Can't keep a good market down, can you? That seems to be the story from Wall Street all of last week. As Fed rate cuts continue to fade from uh, the outlook, stocks apparently not perturbed. And that's the backdrop that we enter this week looking at. But of course, this marks the return of macro event risk. And so things get much more exciting this week than they looked when we were looking at this last week, when all we had was a bit of Fed commentary and not much else to go on. Welcome. This is Macro Money. I'm Ilya Spivak, head of Global Macro here at Tasty Live. And this week, things get action-packed once again. We're going to take a look at what we have on the calendar here that might start moving these markets as soon as within 24 hours from now. We're here at uh, the tail end of Monday's trading session just after the closing bell. Uh, and we're going to take a look at what comes next, not just out of the U.S., but elsewhere also. Uh, there's a bit more event risk outside of the um U.S. that might be relevant for these markets, uh, in particular out of Japan. Uh, and uh, we'll take a look at that as well. But as ever, the key question still on the minds of investors is how many rate cuts are too few? Where are we in this cycle? And is there a magical point where you've shed enough cuts to give the markets vertigo? So we'll start with a look at where we've arrived now. And we can see that there has been a very clear change of dynamic here since the beginning of 2024 uh, as relative to what was happening uh, for most of last year. And we focus here on the back half of last year where you, you can see fewer rate cuts being baked in for 2024 cent stocks lower. As you got more rate cuts, stocks went higher. And then right here, as the calendar turns to 2024, you seem to have a pointed shift. The amount of rate cuts is diminishing and stocks continue going higher. This is obviously a very different set of circumstances uh, than anything we saw last year. And part of it, of course, has been a potent run of U.S. economic data. If we consider what has been happening against this backdrop, note that through that second half of 2023, right here, U.S. economic data was deteriorating relative to forecasts. That doesn't mean that, 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 that it was bad. In fact, the U.S. economy remains the envy of the developed world and developing, for that matter, which has been pulled lower dramatically by weakness in China. The U.S. is easily the outsized growth story uh, for the past several years. But the question, of course, is a question of relative terms. What are the markets expecting versus what's actually occurring? And you can see that you're in this kind of bad news is good news world all through the second half of last year, largely because what you find is that good news is being met with a sense that this just means fewer cuts, but the economy is generally weakening. And so that you get fewer cuts is a scary thing. And stocks don't like it. Now, we're in a very different sort of situation where instead we have data starting to look better than expected. And so even though you're shedding rate cuts, stocks are able to go up because it seems like that we're shedding rate cuts for good reasons, not bad ones. We're shedding them because the economy is stronger. The business cycle appears to be in higher gear than expected. And so perhaps the markets genuinely believe that at this stage, you could do with fewer rate cuts and 
the soft landing scenario that everybody is hoping is going to materialize after uh, the post-COVID adjustments uh, and the come down of inflation thanks to the Fed's tightening uh, over the course of the past year and a half or so, that this soft landing will not be imperiled by fewer cuts if the economy is, in fact, as strong as it looks. And so we find ourselves now in this interesting uh, space, which very much follows the script we might have been familiar with last year. What we learned last year is very similar to what we're looking at now. Here was an upswell in U.S. economic data at the start of 2023. And of course, we know how this turned out. The markets were cutting back Fed rate cut expectations then as well. Up until the point that rates rose high enough that they found the pocket of vulnerability in credit markets linked to regional banks with heavy exposure to the tax sector, where, of course, uh, conditions had been difficult ever since the Fed rate hike cycle started. Those businesses, of course, very sensitive to higher borrowing costs, given their dependence uh, oftentimes on venture capital uh, and so forth. And so we had a situation where there was a troubled industry, there was a set of banks overly exposed to, uh, to weakness in that industry, and rates went high enough that those banks started to look like they might be financially hampered. There was a run on those banks. The markets panicked. Not surprisingly, the question for markets now is, where is that pain point here? How many rate cuts do you need to shed before the markets stop feeling generally good about what, what it all means? And of course, we've seen instances where when the rate cuts uh, are shedding out of the outlook for generally good reasons, stocks can go up. You can see that right here, for example. Uh, you start to see rate cuts come in from about the beginning of June and into July and August as you get the remnants of that SVB-led banking crisis contained, as it starts to look like the situation with the debt ceiling debate of that time is going to be resolved without calamity of some sort. And so rate cuts diminish because the risk diminishes and stocks can power higher until they get to a certain amount of minimum rate cuts, except for risk to hold up. And as they diminish further, stocks crumble. So the question now is, is there such a point somewhere close to where we're sitting? And will the data that comes out this week give us that rollover? Now, an asset that's been doing relatively better and relatively more sort of textbook in the face of all of this is the US dollar. We can see here with the adjustment in rate cut odds, there's a very clear move higher in the dollar. That's because of course, fewer rate cuts means the dollar's yield appeal is greater than it was with more rate cuts. And so now that we're looking to shed perhaps only 1% from baseline rates over the course of the coming year, you can see the spread here now, 100 basis points, that's down from 158 or so at the peak down here. The dollar has been a very clear winner and has been inching higher against its major counterparts. That's largely, of course, because there's not been the same kind of change for them. In fact, in the case of the euro, which is the largest counterpart for the dollar on global markets, the most liquid, the situation has actually moved the other way. The ECB is expected to be more dovish based on the direction of the adjustment seen in policy rates uh, expectations over the past several weeks, as opposed to less. So the dollar has, in fact, performed as one might expect. And so the question now then is, do these moves have follow through? Are we, in fact, now in a kind of lasting uh, 
all things U.S. go up together because the economy is better and so rates are higher and the U.S. is diverging from the rest of the world. Is that now a continuity narrative with legs? And of course, the first uh, critical point to test this and probably the the tent pole release for the week uh, comes to us in less than 24 hours here with the U.S. Consumer Price Index report, which is expected to give us the lowest headline inflation since March of 2021 at 2.9%. The makeup almost certainly uh, going to be similar to what we've seen recently. The service sector is still very much the place where inflation lives on. Uh, goods inflation, as we can see, has been squeezed down to essentially nothing. Energy continues to be a full lower, an actual deflationary force, albeit uh, by a diminished margin. Uh, and everything continues to hinge on what's going on in the service sector. Uh, there, of course, uh, housing is the largest component of the story, but there's not really much that the Fed can do there considering they're the reason for it. Uh, the sharp rise in uh, borrowing cost is largely something that's squeezed both buyers and sellers out of the housing market. Sellers don't want to sell because they don't want to then buy something financed much more expensive. That means that the price hasn't come down even as mortgage rates have shot up. And so buyers are essentially priced out on all counts. With that in mind, there is a situation here where the story really hinges on labor and the lingering 2.5 to 3 million shortage in the labor market relative to demand. So it is here that we get to the question of how many rate cuts is too few for the market's comfort. Because we've had this run-up of good U.S. economic data, it might stand to reason that the pressure on the prices side of things, especially at the core rate, seen uh, climbing down to 3.7 from 3.9%, the lowest since April 2021, um, that that might be hotter just because the economy is hotter. If economic activity is moving faster, judging by the latest GDP numbers, the latest NFP numbers, the latest PMI numbers, then is what the uh, markets have been expecting, then that demand, that extra demand, might have lifted inflation accordingly. That's what you might expect. And so uh, what you might then see is if analysts' models were off on the speed of the economy, they might similarly be off on how much uh, inflation has managed to hold up. If we get then higher than expected numbers here, more Fed rate cuts might fall out of the outlook. We might start veering on three rather than four. And the question then becomes, okay, well, are we at the pain point yet? Are stocks ready to wobble because things have squeezed in on them or not? It's a similar story uh, going forward when we consider uh, what happens with the other uh, key numbers here. The question, of course, as ever, of the consumer. And this is really where this sort of lingering inflation comes. Over 70% of U.S. economic growth is household consumption. That household consumption, not surprisingly, is a function of people's ability to buy stuff, which is a function of employment and the labor market. The Fed told us all last week, one policy official after another, we had no macro data, but boy, did we have Fed speak. Eight separate policy officials gave speeches, some of them more than one. And what we saw repeatedly uh, is a refrain saying most disinflation so far has come courtesy of supply. And that might have been exhausted now, meaning uh, if we look at the labor 
market. We've seen the disparity in labor supply and demand cut in half. It was about 6 million worker shortage, giving us much faster inflation near the top there in late 2021. Those peaks in inflation you see on the chart there. We've cut that down, as we mentioned, to about two and a half, three. But much of that has come from reducing job openings, not from layoffs, which is why the unemployment rate remains near record lows at 3.7%. That's a little bit off the recent swing bottom at 3.4, but well under four, and essentially within the same narrow range near record lows that it's been for uh, a few years. If, in fact, it is the supply side that's been exhausted, all of the post-COVID uh, supply chain adjustments that were bidding up inflation have been addressed, all of the excess job openings uh, being squeezed out has essentially run its course. The question then becomes a question of demand. And then you need economic slowdown to get the last mile of disinflation to get you back on Fed target. If that's the message that we're going to get from the CPI data, that essentially inflation is a little bit hotter, we probably need demand to come down some, so the economy to slow some to get the last mile of disinflation, then the Fed will need to hold rates higher. And indeed, then the question of how few rate cuts are acceptable comes into sharp relief. But of course, all of that is a function of consumption. And it is on consumption that we're going to get some excellent indicators uh, beyond the inflation numbers this week that will tell us just how much pain needs to be inflicted on the labor market to get things together. And so how few rate cuts do you actually need? The first uh, set of numbers here, the retail sales report, it is expected to show that receipts cooled in January down 0.1% month over month. That's compared with uh, a 0.6% rise in December. A, a bit soggy for a holiday period, but nevertheless, uh, we're expected to uh, come down off that. It was a three-month high, um, and we're expected to see some cooling. But the University of Michigan Consumer Confidence Survey expected to show that not only did sentiment surge in December, but it held up uh, in February uh, after continuing to move higher in January. So things looking relatively upbeat here. The overall sentiment index seen uh, rising to 80 and uh, although there's a bit of sogginess expected in the expectations component, the current conditions index seen holding strong, and perhaps most importantly, inflation expectations unmoved at 2.9%. It is, uh, as we can see in the third quarter of last year, a jump in inflation expectations that ultimately gives us this downshift in sentiment and if we're going to get inflation expectations holding anchored here, perhaps this can continue to stay strong. Once again, of course, U.S. economic data has been tending to beat forecasts, implying that we have a situation here where if we're hotter on the retail sales, just like we might be hotter on uh, the consumer uh, confidence numbers, and on CPI, we keep eating into Fed rate cut bets. And the question becomes, at what point does this become a replay of last year? Where is the magic amount of rate cuts where once we cross the line to fewer than that, stock markets lose footing? And then, looking outside the U.S., probably the most interesting bit of macro risk comes from Japan. Here we are going to get a first look at fourth quarter GDP numbers. Expectations are that we're going to see a rise of 1.4% quarterly, but at an annualized rate. That's, of course, a significant uh, improvement over the 2.9% annualized decline in the third quarter. And 
it'll be really interesting to see what the components of this are. Just last week, there was a very sharp sell-off in the yen because uh, Deputy Governor Uchida of uh, the Bank of Japan came out and said, I don't know why everybody's looking for a hawkish jump in policy. It's probably not coming. And of course, I'm paraphrasing here, but the thrust of the conversation was the markets are seemingly expecting more from the BOJ than they're likely to deliver in terms of normalizing policy and diluting the very uh, dovish setting of the policy mix uh, that's uh, been there for uh, quite a while at this point, combining negative rates with a cap on yields with massive asset purchases. So the question with this GDP number is, is this return to growth enough to validate some level of hawkishness or isn't it? And uh, where we come down on this probably uh, will determine whether the yen continues to flirt with the idea that the Bank of Japan is at some sort of watershed moment or can go back to what is its traditional focus, moving inversely of global yields. And of course, as the markets dissect that part of the story, we might expect to see a yen that's either meaningfully stronger or meaningfully weaker, depending on, ha-ha, what happens with Fed rate cutoffs. Because again, this is the main driver of global borrowing costs, and thereby the traditional uh, North Star for the yen. So this is where things get interesting. one4 percent is indeed a return to growth, but still very much within the range of outcomes since volatility uh, in Japanese growth basically settled post-COVID. It would be essentially getting right back to what is the center line for the recent range. And it's really the makeup of these numbers that should be most interesting. If we look at what happened in the, in the third quarter, we saw that that large decline was a parallel uh, push lower in both what's happening in the private sector and in exports. And what we're looking to see here, perhaps, might be a question of whether domestic demand remains anemic, because, of course, without that domestic demand, the BOJ is not going to do anything in a hurry. But what we do know, of course, is that in the fourth quarter, the yen roared higher as yields fell, as that round of Fed rate cut um, pullbacks that initially started uh, in late October, early November, really started to gain momentum. That That's, of course, this right here. As more and more rate cuts came in and stocks soared, so too did the yen, because it tends to go up when yields decline. And so what we have to ask ourselves is, on the one hand, well, a much stronger yen might be good for domestic demand, might be good for consumption, because it will increase the purchasing power of Japanese consumers. But it might also be bad for the external sector, because it might make Japanese exports more expensive for foreign buyers and drive away demand. So which side of this equation do we land on? Now, there are, of course, lags here, so we might not necessarily get those forces on display in the concurrent quarter's GDP report. But one thing we do know is that CPI data shows us that we have continued disinflation through December, which means that whatever move in the yen did not lead to a brisk pickup in domestic consumption activity that then pressured prices higher in a domestic BOJ-relevant kind of way. Instead, inflation continued to ease largely as food costs, which are easily the biggest component here, continued to pull back. And this, of course, is why the BOJ is not looking to make big changes, because most of the inflation is imported. Now, we can see that food prices still have some ways to keep falling, considering there's about a seven-month lag between their transmission into CPI, so there's still some months to go to price in further declines. And so what we then are likely to get from this uh, GDP uptick is not anything that 
is necessarily supportive of a more hawkish central bank, even with the return to growth. If the yen manages to hold up against this backdrop, then perhaps the markets will have finally come to the idea that the Bank of Japan is in no hurry to tighten because the inflation is mainly imported. Jettison excess speculation around that possibility, which still seems to have uh, market moving potential, despite the fact that this state of affairs has persisted for over a year and aggressive BOJ action, at least to me, seemed always unlikely. And so if the yen holds, it would mean that something that doesn't necessarily increase hawkish BOJ chances isn't a major headwind now, which would be good news for a return to trading on the basis of yields, making the yen once again a proxy for the Fed outlook. And if that means that the that uh, we're ready to get back to a yen that gains because the BOJ is the only central bank not cutting, that might be one of the better setups risk-reward-wise across financial markets at this point. And that is macro money for t today. Uh, as ever, we are here Monday through Thursday, right after Overtime, a show I co-host with Chris Vecchio and Dylan Radigan. I'm back on with Chris for Futures Power Hour on Fridays, on with Tom and Tony for First Call on Sundays, writing for the News and Insights portion of TastyLive.com, and opining on the platform formerly known as Twitter, at Ilya Spivak. Thanks very much for joining. See everybody tomorrow. Take care.